What primary forces hold matter together? How can energy be extracted from these forces? How can understanding be obtained about the material world, both living and non-living? These questions have been asked since the earliest time, but today, man is closer to answering them than ever before. One basic approach in obtaining such understanding is to study the smallest full part. Determine how it functions, how it relates to other parts, and to the whole. To study progressively smaller particles of matter, man has developed equipment to extend his senses. First with optical instruments, then on microscopes. Recently developed field scopes show individual atoms as white dots. By careful adjustment, single atoms can be removed at will to see deeper into the sample. But in man's attempt to discover the basis of all matter, scientists need to explore even further into the interior of the atomic nucleus itself. Such studies are extremely difficult because the nucleus is 100,000 times smaller than an atom. To illustrate the approximate size of the nucleus, imagine a uranium atom enlarged to the size of a football stadium. The nucleus would then be about 1 32nd of an inch in diameter and would weigh about 1 million pounds. One practical reason for studying the nucleus is that it might provide an almost limitless source of energy. As an illustration, if all of the thermonuclear energy in this one drop of water could be transformed into electrical energy, according to Einstein's principle of the conversion of matter to energy, then theoretically there would be sufficient power to burn a 100 watt light continuously for over 60 years. Similarly, the amount of thermonuclear energy in one cup of heavy water would supply the electrical needs of metropolitan San Francisco for an average 24-hour period. But this is not possible today because man does not know enough about how energy is derived from nuclear forces. The present nuclear research is an attempt to explain the questions behind many natural phenomena, such as the conversion of matter into energy which takes place continuously as material in the sun is changed into radiant energy. Early man's curiosity about the sun and other natural phenomena was satisfied by myths. During the many centuries since that time, he has searched for answers to the fundamental questions about the world surrounding him. Today, this quest for understanding continues in scientific institutions throughout the world. One of these institutions is the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, whose Berkeley site is visible in the foreground. Research is replacing pure speculation with new knowledge, fundamental knowledge that could be used in further technological development that may contribute material gains to civilization. To provide new foundations of knowledge upon which to grow, continued research into the sub-nuclear world is necessary. This evolves into a never-ending cycle of basic research which is truly a beginning without end. This laboratory is a product of man's curiosity about the true nature of the world around him. One man possessing this curiosity was the late Professor Ernest O. Lawrence, who from an idea in 1929 developed a revolutionary machine, the cyclotron. From the first cyclotron, nine inches in diameter, larger cyclotrons were developed, which have become major tools in extending man's senses, thus permitting research in atomic and sub-nuclear particles. It was during the 1930s that many distinguished scientists aided in developing the cyclotron into operational research equipment. The young scientist seen on the right is now the director of the entire laboratory, Dr. Edwin McMillan. These men and others established a new pattern of basic research, team research, 
with specialists from different fields pooling their skills to build larger and more powerful cyclotrons, extending the researcher's ability to study progressively smaller particles in the nucleus. In addition, the cyclotron was used to produce radioactive isotopes that had practical application for medical research. This was the start of research in nuclear medicine and the founding of the Donner Laboratory. During an appearance on national educational television, Professor Lawrence explained how the cyclotron works. Now here we have a, um, a mechanical model of the cyclotron which perhaps might be helpful in understanding how it works. There are uh, two semicircular electrodes in the vacuum chamber of the cyclotron uh, which uh, so to speak, move up and down in potential. Here we have two plates that move up and down in potential, and the particles are generated here at the center, so if they start here, and this is up, and, and this half is down, they will go across downhill and pick up energy. And uh, we'll start it off. Here it's up, here it's down, 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 down. These two are going up and down, so the particle always crosses the region between downhill, and therefore the particles spiral out on ever-widening circles, finally coming to the periphery where they strike the target for the nuclear investigation. Indeed, the first atomic disintegrations in our country were produced by this 11-inch cyclotron. Then came the 27-inch uh, cyclotron, which produced four or five million volt particles and produced many new radioactive isotopes. And then followed the 60 inch cyclotron. It produced up to 40 million volt particles. Just prior to World War II, Professor Lawrence was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for his contributions to nuclear research. It was in this research environment that Dr. Glenn T. Seaborg became a leader in the discovery of new elements heavier than uranium. The research with fissionable material convinced Professor Lawrence that Hitler might develop an atomic bomb. He pointed out the dangers and contributed leadership to the Manhattan Project to develop an atomic device first in the United States. Professor Lawrence used the magnet of the uncompleted 184-inch cyclotron in the development of the electromagnetic method for obtaining fissionable uranium for the Manhattan Project. The extensive research and development achievements of the Manhattan Project suggested that the national welfare would benefit from a vigorous program of nuclear research. To provide national leadership and control of the program, a civilian agency, the Atomic Energy Commission, was formed. The AEC is the major sponsor for programs of nuclear research, including those at the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory. Federal sponsorship permitted the completion in 1946 of the 184-inch cyclotron as a research facility. Subsequently, the Bevatron, a much higher energy accelerator, was constructed. In 1954, it became operational, and in the years since, it has revolutionized our knowledge of sub-nuclear particles. In the post-war period, scientific history was made by the discovery of new chemical elements. This water cave, with tanks of water four feet thick and a window also containing four feet of water, was developed to shield the operators from the radioactivity emitted from some of the new elements. During the quarter century following 1940, nuclear chemists at Berkeley made major contributions to expanding the periodic chart by adding 11 new elements. The search for new elements is continuing. In an experiment, the heavy ion linear accelerator is used in the production of new atoms. They are deposited on stainless steel tape that transports them past special detectors from which it can be determined if a new element is present. With the discovery of a new element or isotope, the work has just started. For detailed investigations of the nuclide must be made. Some investigators use the iron-free spectrometer in which the Earth's magnetic field is cancelled in order to measure exactly the energies of electrons emitted from the nucleus. This equipment is the most accurate of its kind known. 
The information about the structure and behavior of nuclides is then published to aid other scientists. Another area of investigation for nuclear chemists is the study of the detailed structure of nuclei by using particle beams of relatively high energy and intensity from the 88-inch cyclotron. In contrast, a relatively small radiation source is used chemists in the biodynamics laboratory to irradiate a vessel containing three of the chemicals that were present in the Earth's atmosphere four billion years ago. This research indicates that these chemicals could have evolved into the complex organic molecules that are the building blocks for living matter. In another area of research with living matter, scientists attempt to discover how plants convert sunlight and simple chemicals into food. A key factor in the scientist's technique is the injection of radioactive carbon into the plant's environment. This tracer element allows the biochemist to follow the complex sequence of chemical reactions involved in a plant's food production cycle. This type of basic biological research can help agricultural scientists increase the world's food supply. Another of the many uses of radioactive tracer elements is by the physicians in the Donner Laboratory at Berkeley, who have been using tracer elements to aid in the diagnosis of diseases for years. The tracer elements absorbed by parts of the body are accurately located with the scintillation camera. After diagnosis is made, standard medical or surgical procedures can be used to effect relief. In recent years, external radiotherapy of the pituitary gland has been used successfully in controlling a number of abnormal conditions, including Cushing's disease and acromegaly. For treatment, a beam of high energy particles from the 184 inch cyclotron is precisely aligned with the pituitary gland in the center of the patient's head. With head rotation, the radiation dose is concentrated in the pituitary gland. In essence, the beam becomes a kind of nuclear scalpel as a substitute for surgery. Pick the patient before treatment and after treatment provide visual evidence of the promise for the future. Similarly, some of the work by the Inorganic Materials Research Division could be applied in the near future. This division is attempting to understand how materials behave in extreme environments, such as in the core of a nuclear reactor and in outer space. These extreme environments require materials with vastly improved properties. Today's scientists can look at the basic building blocks of matter atoms seen by the technique of electron diffraction. With this technique, the atomic structure on the surface of a metal can be explored as well as the internal crystal structure. A keynote of this division, typifying the laboratory in general, is the simultaneous attack on a problem by scientists versed in many disciplines, physics, chemistry, metallurgy, and ceramics. Another example of research requiring a number of disciplines is the study of superconductivity, the transmission of electricity without loss, zero resistance. Presently, it is necessary that the sample be cooled to the temperature of liquid helium, minus 273 degrees centigrade to achieve superconductivity. This investigation has resulted in the discovery of new materials that can be used in experimental magnets capable of doing the same job as a conventional magnet ten times larger. The research is well suited to the Berkeley Laboratory, which started on the University of California Berkeley campus and expanded up the hill to the present site. In 1952, the nation needed a new laboratory to conduct research and development in applications of nuclear energy. At the request of the Atomic Energy Commission, Professor Lawrence, with Dr. Edward Teller, started the laboratory at Livermore.
The present director of the Livermore Laboratory, Dr. Michael May, is a well-known theoretical physicist. He is noted for his fundamental research in astrophysics and the design of nuclear devices for military and civilian use. One of the physicist's most valuable tools in assessing the many interrelationships involved in designing nuclear devices is the high-speed computer. In addition to studying the numerical computer printouts, an experiment can be formed. This computer-originated film illustrates the principal stress lines as a shock wave passes through two different mediums. This type of experimental physics concepts gives the physicist a more comprehensive representation before an actual test is conducted. An example of Livermore's research in depth is the use of this induction plasma furnace to study the chemical processes that occur during a nuclear explosion. This study is important to many of the programs at the laboratory, but of particular interest to plowshare because the materials heated by the plasma follow a course in cooling similar to that experienced in a nuclear explosion. The plowshare program originated from the vision of Livermore's scientific leaders who foresaw the potential of employing this new energy source for peaceful applications. In the Sudan test conducted by the plowshare division, a 100 kiloton thermonuclear device buried 630 feet underground. The purpose of the test was to investigate the possibility of using nuclear explosives for large-scale earth-moving projects. Preliminary results indicated that nuclear energy can move vast amounts of earth at a fraction of the cost of conventional methods and could make economically practical the construction of new harbors, cutting passes through mountains, or excavation for canals. In addition, there is the possibility of using underground nuclear explosives for the recovery of natural resources that, with present technology, are not economically feasible. This industrial application of underground nuclear explosives might make it possible to recover untapped sources of copper ore, oil, and natural gas. One of the prerequisites for the plowshare program is the study in depth of all anticipated fallout hazards. Part of the investigation is being performed by a section of the biomedical group which is collecting biological samples near the site of the Sudan nuclear test. The research involves extracting all the water from the samples of animals, plants, and soils by vacuum distillation, or as it is commonly called, freeze drying. The water from the samples is mixed with a scintillation fluid that permits the detection of one type of radioactivity. This study is part of the overall research by the biomedical group which is concerned with radioactive hazards that may enter man's food chains and be carried to the ultimate sites of deposit in the body. Another group is trying to determine whether very low amounts of radiation have any effect on humans. In this research, chromosomes are irradiated, then examined for change. The investigation is rewarding, but the research time required to classify chromosomes is extensive. The operator in the background is photographing chromosomes through a microscope. Then each chromosome is cut from a print for classification. Presently, development is underway to electronically translate chromosome pictures into computer language for classification. It is anticipated that computers could in one minute perform the work it would take a technician one hour to do. This is just one example in which the scientist's creative ability in theory and concept is paralleled by the engineering staff, only advancing the of the art for fabricating and testing various prototypes. So the chain of professional competence is incomplete without the skill of the technicians who make the parts. Build the equipment. and assist in conducting the research. 
A vital part of much research is the construction of prototype models. This fabrication has required the machining of parts from radioactive materials never before machined and to within tolerances approaching perfection. To meet the extreme tolerances required by the scientists, machinists have had to develop, adapt, and refine new techniques and equipment. Many times the capabilities of men and equipment have been extended to fabricate what was considered to be impossible. But equally important to making the parts is inspection. For it can't be made if it can't be measured. Behind this maxim is the successful development of new inspection techniques to advance the art of measurement. Such precise measurements are made at Livermore that some of the standards established here are used to calibrate gauges for other AEC contractors. One type of machining not performed at Livermore is the shaping of high explosives into precise configurations. This machining must be performed by remote control whenever there is a significant risk of detonation. The machining of high explosives is just one of the special operations conducted at Site 300, a few miles from Livermore. This is basically a test area for applied physics research using high explosives. In this test, an eight-pound sphere of high explosive was used to study the low-pressure ignition of a liquid explosive, nitromethane. All interlocks made up. Here, we'll see. Here we go. During the test, the low-pressure shock wave on the left-hand side passes into the nitromethane. It is followed by a black arc that indicates a low-order detonation. Some of the experiments made at Site 300 are preliminary tests of components for nuclear devices to be used in underground tests. But nuclear devices are never detonated at this 7,000-acre site because of its proximity to populated areas. Underground nuclear explosions, in addition to their role in national defense, give scientists a unique method for synthesizing heavy elements. Exposure of a target material to the high neutron flux during the explosion rapidly produces quantities of rare transuranium elements. Material is removed by drilling into the blast area. Then core samples are shipped to Livermore for analysis by nuclear chemists. The examination of nuclear debris continues to provide information about thermonuclear explosions and the resultant release of immense energy, such as occurs in the sun. But to gain the full benefit from thermonuclear energy, the reactions must be controlled. An example from nature of the steady release of thermonuclear energy is sunlight. Presently, physicists in the Sherwood program are trying, in effect, to create miniature suns on Earth in order to draw electrical power from thermonuclear reactions. Their immediate goal is to learn how to contain the thermonuclear fuel in the form of a dilute but extremely hot gas, hotter than the interior of the sun. To do this, they use machines containing so-called magnetic bottles created by powerful magnet coils. The fuel for thermonuclear reactors, commonly called heavy water, is a fraction of 1% of ordinary seawater and can be separated by an inexpensive process. If the heavy water contained in the Pacific Ocean were extracted, there would be enough thermonuclear fuel to supply the entire world with electrical energy present rate of use for ten times as long as the universe has existed. The problems are great, but the rewards are enormous. The motivation and skill of these men who are attempting to create an earthbound sun, then harness it, is characteristic of more than just the Sherwood groups. It is typical of the laboratory in general. But scientists can't do the job single-handed. 
people with many different skills are needed to keep the laboratory running smoothly and to maintain it as a safe and attractive place to work. While the scientists are in the foreground of the research effort, it requires about seven people in support to allow each scientist to apply his time to research. In addition to time employees, there are part-time employees at both Berkeley and Livermore, some of whom are graduate students. Graduate students have occupied a central role in the work of the laboratory since its origin in the physics department on the Berkeley campus of the University of California. As members of research teams, their thesis research is guided by senior scientists, several of whom have received the Nobel Prize. It's the curiosity of these young scientists that has helped keep the laboratory dynamic and youthful, furthering both their own and the laboratory's investigation of fundamental questions. A lead search for new knowledge is Dr. Edwin McMillan, the director of the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, who received the Nobel Prize for his co-discovery of Neptunium and Plutonium. Several years later, he originated a major principle of today's high-energy accelerators. One of the most famous is the Bevatron at the Berkeley Laboratory. Hidden underneath the Bevatron's massive shielding is the complex machinery to accelerate matter to almost the speed of light. The purpose of this research in high-energy physics is to explain the nature of matter. The practical research starts when a particle from a beam collides with atomic nuclei. New particles are created. These events are recorded photographically from the particle tracks made visible in spark chambers and bubble chambers. The photographic image of a nuclear event is first scanned by technicians who visually select the particle tracks of interest to a physicist. The film is then placed in a highly sophisticated measuring machine. The nuclear events previously selected are found and the track of each visible particle from the nuclear event is measured to within two ten thousandths of an inch. Basically, this equipment reduces the particle tracks into numerical data that is fed in for further calculations. It is these computer printouts that extended the physicist's senses deep into the nucleus and allow him to identify known particles of matter. But more dramatically, this research has led to the discovery of new particles, such as the antiproton. By 1966, more than one-third of all nuclear particles have been discovered in the hydrogen bubble chambers at Berkeley. But knowledge is not easily obtained. There are normally a number of progressive steps. Initially, the product of all this research is data, statistics, and reports, which can develop into new bodies of knowledge, knowledge that can extend man's power to control his environment. But first, there must be research, patient, painstaking research before new knowledge can be obtained. As each new plateau of knowledge and technology is gained, the prospects of reaching a higher plateau are greater. This is a progressive cycle of research and development that is based upon the continuous striving for knowledge, pure knowledge and knowledge applied, knowledge for strength to keep the peace, knowledge for industry and knowledge for health. This striving for new knowledge is truly a beginning without end.